Hey, welcome to the show today. If you're the only one that's involved in making investment decisions, it's a pretty good idea to try to understand the world that will potentially exist when it's time to access the wealth that you've been building. In the decades prior to the 1929 stock market crash, technological change was crazy. Talking to your mom may have required a horse ride in 1900, but in 1929, you could have simply just picked up the phone and given her a call. Imagine how euphoric and unstoppable people felt during this time. Surely, there was no problem that technology couldn't solve. Sound familiar? Innovation happening in multiple layers creates transformation. The transformation destroys the status quo, but then creates something new, and euphoria shortly follows suit. This seeps into share markets and ultimately supercharges sentiment. So, is it possible we're heading for a crash? This is what many are saying right now. All the dials on all the gauges are pointing to the fact that we're at some sort of new place that we've never been to before. On the flip side, is it also possible that we're just getting started? Interest rates are almost guaranteed not to rise. We've busted through any previous points of resistance in terms of all-time highs in almost every sector. So perhaps the punch bowl of quantitative easing has been supplemented with a glass table, a rolled up 20, and a little white bag. What do we do? What's a rational response? To an irrational situation. Wait it out, call for the end of the world so that hopefully the market hears you, or diligently keep building, knowing that in the long term you should be okay. Now Julian McCormack, an investment specialist with Platinum Asset Management, is my special guest today. He and I are going to have a chat around GameStop, money printing, Japanification, and ultimately where the market will take us next. I want to thank our partner Hatch, an online investment platform providing New Zealanders access to the US share market. Check out the notes for a link to claim a $20 credit for the first $100 that you deposit into a brand new Hatch account. Please be sure to like and share this episode. Let's make a start. Now, we had you on the show here, Julian, episode 88, 16th of March last year, mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. before all the fun stuff started to happen. And it was almost, it was bizarre because I think one of the themes of that episode was talking about investing in a bubble. And then all of a sudden, bam, this this giant pinprick called COVID came along and it all kind of came crashing down. But then it kind of built built itself back up again. So that was kind of our last chat. I really enjoyed that because it was very um, it was very intellectually stimulating. I found it quite cool because you, you have a really good background in history. So it's not like most people when they're commenting on the state of play, we're looking at things right now. But you draw upon quite a lot of a, a, quite a lot of a backstory. So I'm keen specifically to start with your perspective on what's happening with GameStop. You know, what is that, what is that deal? What, what, what does that mean? And what is that symptomatic of? So I think, I think the whole GameStop thing has been um, somewhat uh, misrepresented. It, it's sort of been presented as a sort of class warfare type deal with sort of the, you know, the, the average Joe getting it uh, over, over hedge funds in particular, you know, the, the hedge fund community within, within Wall Street. Uh, I don't think that's happened at all. I think elements of the hedge fund community have got it over other elements of the hedge fund community. And there's been a very, very thin, very, very pointy end of the spear that was retail. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I love some of these guys. You know, I, I think Roaring Kitty, you know, the, the guy who analysed GameStop months and months ago, I think he's great. I think he has a really sensible approach to markets. And I think he did some good work about GameStop. But... Um, what I think happened was retail money helped to identify a particular vulnerability in a very, very high short interest stock and it publicised it and, and then other real money investors, so that's a, that's a judgmental thing to say, other large money investors saw that and thought, you beauty, I'm, I'm going to get you. And they did. Mm. I guess what you're saying is like the, the retail crowd, this hive mind, the hooded warrior type image that you have maybe they were the catalyst maybe they were the spearhead like you say but once mm -hmm. they made their move it was basically just the battle of the hedge funds after that is that kind of what what you're suggesting i think so i, yeah. I don't i don't have any data or, or quantitative evidence to to demonstrate that but but yeah. that's the vibe i get talking to yeah. you know hedge fund guys who are friends of mine and and our dealers and you know, people in yeah. in markets that you know that the and then it gets presented as you know, this class thing, or, or, or I don't know how you'd describe it, some sort of social faction type thing. I, I think that's people external to the system investing 
their own wishes about what would happen into the system and, mm. and I don't think it really happened. Yeah, that's a good perspective on it. It's a, it's a nice balanced perspective to the story, I guess, of, of David and Goliath, which is kind of, that's yeah. the one that you kind of gravitate towards because it's such a cool story. And obviously yeah. you want to side with the underdog, right? Yeah, go David, but that's right. I don't, I don't think there was a David involved or not much. Yeah. Not much of a David, yeah, and and he had to he had to go upstairs for dinner in his parents' basement, so <laughs> that's all good. <laughs> now, uh, so Julian, in terms of what that points to, though, so it, it points to or it highlights something, I guess, that maybe retail investors in particular or self directed investors aren't normally that cognizant of. Are we actually playing a game which is fair? Do we have a chance to actually build new money, new wealth in the new world? Or are the odds actually stacked against us? I, I, I think if people, oh man, this is going to sound so motherhood and boring, but if people take, you know, if people spend less than they earn and they take the difference and they put that in the markets systematically over time for their entire working life, they will retire rich. Hmm. That's just life. So hmm. that's it's so, it's so simple. Thing. People People miss that though, right? It's not exciting yeah. enough to tell that story. That's the problem, no. right? No, mm -hmm. it's not. That said, the start point matters because if I'd done that in Japan uh, starting in 1989, um, you know, that market's half where it was, you know, 30 years ago. Mm. So it doesn't mean you made no money, by the way. It doesn't mean you've halved your money because it fell and then bounced. So you would have, you know, if you're contributing all the way, you would have actually made some money along the way, but the, the internal rate of return probably... Hmm. It's pretty ordinary from the start point. Hmm. And why I raise that is uh, Japan in 89 was one of the great bubbles of all time. And we're in something analogous. It's an attenuated version of it. It's not as bad, but it's hmm. bad. You, you know, we are, we're a long way out the gangplank here in hmm. terms of, in terms of valuation. And hmm. um, that part of the GameStop story, I think is more important. There is, so, so this is a chaotic process now. You know, we're in a bubble and they can go anywhere. So uh, there is very little predictive ability that one can have in short increments of time. And, and that sounds like I'm hedging the question or, you know, avoiding the question or whatever. I, I actually want to get across to people the absolute impossibility of knowing outcomes in a chaotic system, right? Mm. It is just impossible. It's not that a little bit of additional work or data or a better model or whatever will give you the ability to predict anything. It doesn't. What it will give you is the ability to understand probabilities tomorrow, the next day, whatever. That is possible. That's absolutely possible. That's what we all do. But what must not be, you know, sort of assumed is that there's someone out there with the right model, the right mm. system, the right data, and they know that that's not right. That's mm. not right. We'll That's right. So we can kind of we can kind of look look at the weather patterns. We we know that rain should be coming based on what we can see, but yeah. really there's no amount of due diligence that can allow you no. to know the mind of those clouds, right? No, no, that, that, that's right. And then um, weather prediction is a good analogy, um, but somewhat flawed because we our understanding of the weather doesn't influence the weather. But our understanding of financial markets then influences financial markets. Um, I'm minded of uh, a terrific guy, uh, uh, Grantham, um, uh, you know, from uh, uh, GMO, uh, was saying in uh, late 17, we might have a melt-up. We might have a really incredible melt-up, uh, as was witnessed at the end of the, you know, 1990s and early 2000s cycle and that kind of happened but very briefly and then markets corrected and i think almost what happened was the the narrative of the melt-up prevented their ability to be a proper melt-up mm, because okay. because people responded to it um mm. now the other thing i want to emphasize about the gamestop thing as a general principle is uh dumb money comes to the table late it happens in every cycle and you know i, I don't mean to be offensive it's just true you know, if I was telling people with huge savings and cash on the sideline whether they should rush in to buy a market right now, hell no, absolutely not. And, and, and let me just demonstrate that. Market cap to GDP in US equities 
has never been higher. It's one hundred the one hundred percent of percentile. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even after last week, like remember after last week's fear and loathing, we're two percent off the highs. Yeah, of all time. So we ain't gone nowhere. Um, uh, trailing PE, we're about the 99th percentile. Um, um, cyclically adjusted PE, so 10-year average earnings uh, to price, uh, we're at about the 97th percentile. Um, price to sales, about the 100th. Price to book, about the 100th. So we are about as expensive as we've ever been in the history of markets. Mm -hmm. But there's an interesting wrinkle on that because the, the measure that we're not at an all-time high is equity valuation, so earnings yield, invert the P, get an earnings yield, to bond yield. Okay. That's, that's a bit of the road. But what that's saying is, from the perspective of, from the position of all-time low uh, yields, so all-time high bond prices, because yield and price are inverse, mm -hmm. we're not that expensive. So mm -hmm. relative to the highest price in the history of humanity, going back about 5,000 years, we have never been this expensive in bonds, but relative to that, we're not too bad in equities. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at the, all the gauges in front of you as you're driving along, everything is pointing to red hot, you know, real red hot, you know, extreme yeah. speed, you've got low yeah. tire pressure, oil lights yeah. flashing on, Battery's low, whatever. It's all it's all bad, but we still cannot say it's going to be next week or next year nope. even because nope. we're we're in uncharted territory. So when we're in uncharted territory, understandably, all indicators will misread because we haven't been there before. Yep. There's no reference point, right? Yep, yep. And look, my guess is we've we've got a little ways to run. Mm. So uh, the indicators that, or, or some indicators that would help one get a sense that this is really, really over. Uh, one would be central bank tightening around <laughs> 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 your life. Uh, I, I, I'm not totally up to date on what the RBNZ is doing, but I know they're being pretty accommodative. Uh, mm -hmm. Over here, we're pegged at 0 0.1 to 2024. Wow. Um, Phil Lowe was saying yesterday. Powell, I think, was saying in the States, we're not thinking about thinking about raising rates. And 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 so that and and they're quite clearly positioning everybody for a greater tolerance for inflation moving forward, and indeed a desire for inflation moving forward. Mm. Point one. The other point mm. too is um, the economy is not slowing; the economy is violently reaccelerating. It's kind of contrary to what you would think, because we've been told from a few other loud voices that the economy will eventually snap markets back into reality that but what you're saying is that stimulus has stimulated is that kind of what you're saying it's a whole layer cake effect yeah stimulus is a big part of it absolutely you're correct to identify it but just the me mechanical part let, let's just start with where we were so in q2 and q3 of 2020 major economies shrank by you know 20 and 30 percent hmm. so the base effect is very low hmm. Right, we're starting from a low point. So if we just go back anywhere towards where we were in like 2019, we get this big growth effect just mechanically, right? So that that doesn't that shouldn't excite anybody. It's just a mechanical reality, right? Mm. Point one. Point two, what have been the two big things that have kicked the guts out of the global economy since 2017? Because remember in 2017, we had global synchronous uh, global global synchronous growth. Mm -hmm. It was you know, roughly trend growth. It wasn't that exciting. It was like three and a half percent global GDP real. Um, but uh, you know anything economically exposed in markets was just flying. You know our portfolio went ballistic. A whole bunch of people you know looked looked like us went went nuts. What what's happened since then? Trade war, global pandemic. Mm -hmm. Trade wars. Uh, that, that's got, that's done. So you're going to get lots of rhetoric. But just look at who's been, uh, um, you know, appointed by the Biden administration. It's, these are very, very consensus names, right? So these are these are back to the Obama, Bush, Clinton, Bush years. Total Washington consensus, with a veneer of oh, we're a bit tough on China, but that's over the top of mm. what's underneath, which is that Washington consensus stuff. Open markets, free movement of capital, blah blah blah, right? Mm. With with the rhetoric over the top. 
And let me then just compare that to what just happened, which was a trade war not between uh, the US and China, it was between the US and everybody. So anybody, and let me, you know, let me count the ways. I mean, it was Thailand, Vietnam, South Korea, Japan, Germany, all of the EU, Canada, Mexico, Brazil, I'm forgetting a few, Turkey. They were all threatened with tariffs, had tar tariffs imposed, or were threatened with currency manipulation status by the Trump administration. Hmm. I mean, that's just never happened. Hmm. It, yeah. Probably in the 30s, you know, hoots Molly, that kind of stuff, probably, probably might, might have might yeah. now to it. But, but that's gone. I mean, that, that, so the people who are being appointed by this administration are nothing like Navarro, Lighthizer, and Trump. And um, that separation from sanity is over. So why does that matter? Because uh, there was a very, very significant industrial slowdown in the global economy from 2018 on. Mm. Um, so imagine trying to buy a house and I say to you, the I don't know if you guys have stamp duty, it might not be a good no, analogy. No. Yeah. Um, I don't know, so property tax could be zero or it could be 25. And I don't, uh, next month, and I'm not gonna tell you which it is. So you're gonna buy a house, buy a house next month? Well, I don't know. Because should I buy a smaller house because I have to buy, pay more tax or, you know, should I just wait or what should I do? Some people will transact, some people will have to, some people will be forced to. That has, what's hap has been what's happening in all global supply lines if anyone wants to export to the United States at all for the last three years. Hmm. Yeah. So you've got this very significant diminution of activity. And we see that in activity stuff from like factory automation guys like Siemens, um, the Japanese machine tool makers, the robotics guys, all those guys. So, so Japanese machine tool makers have bounced violently off the low and they are now at the lows of 2016, which was right. a real, real slowdown. So we had this... Right. So, so we would put it another way, in billions of yen, Japanese machine tool orders were down like 70% and it bounced back up to about down half right. from where they right. were peaking in 2018. So yeah. uh, early 2018. So um, you've got this re-acceleration of the industrial economy going on because supply lines were a little bit starved of capital for three years. And then we've got this reopening stuff. Mm, and it's, that's right. it's, it's real, that's gonna happen. <laughs> um, mm. It's not going to be a simple fix. I mean, this stuff is complicated, and uh, it, it, it's going to there's going to be bumps along the way. But probability of one, we're going to get back to something like normality. The time frame I wouldn't want to put to <laughs> tie a yeah. band around, but I think it's relatively quick. Just like when you when you're sick, it's impossible to imagine being healthy. It's kind of I guess that's the mindset that we're coming out of now is that immediately you just almost forget what it was like to be sick we've mm -hmm. pretty soon we'll forget oh yeah there was this trump guy in power and there was this whole <laughs> trade war thing going on and yeah that pandemic thing i guess that stopped as well right so there's a, mm -hmm. these two lines of or two tunnels that we're coming out of at the same time mm -hmm. or two sticks i guess on a fire mm -hmm. right and the gasoline mm -hmm. that's been mm -hmm. poured on it uh all that sort of uh, quantitative easing. We're just waiting for a bit of a strike on, on, totally. on that fire, right? Totally. And 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 you know, don't you know, don't don't believe me. Just watch. Um, like, yeah. don't take my word for it. Look at commodity prices yeah. and currencies. So all these little currencies, you know, Aussies, Kiwis, the loonie in Canada, Mexican peso, but then the big trade currencies, uh, Korean won, Chinese yuan, they've all been really strong. And all the commodities have moved up really aggressively. So, so copper's at eight-year highs. Energy's back in the fifties, mid fifties today. Um, uh, all your base metals have responded really well. Natural gas has bounced really uh, aggressively. Freight rates have gone absolutely ballistic. That's with the United States, whilst not in lockdown, in a very serious state of sort of economic malaise. I know, I know they just printed a four percent number, but you know they've got a long way to go. Uh, and Europe. In all sorts of, you know, distress. Mm. So now it sounds, it sounds almost like you're you're almost like cautiously optimistic here. That's because I look at stuff that's had the stuffing kicked out of it for three years. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Right? So because the reverse of that trade is, um, you know, the COVID winners. 
so, so Amazon is the classic, right? So you've got this huge re uh, sorry, acceleration or bring forward of shopping, you know, Zoom calls like, like we're doing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, look, the growth rates and that stuff is going to tail off. You know, I don't want to do that. I want to come to Auckland and chat with you in person. That's right. So, you know, times that by hundreds of millions. And, yeah. and you know, that, and not just that, uh, all this speaks to the cost of capital. So then we go back to interest rates. Interest rates are going to go up quickly and by quite a lot. It, it, in the world I'm painting for you, that mm. is what's going to happen. Mm. So, so global real GDP growth in the next few quarters is going to be very high. That's not a guess. I mean, it is a guess. We can get yeah. extraneous forces that, that might yeah. prevent but the but I, see, I see what you're saying, though. Like with, with this model that you're building, those are the logical yeah. conclusions. Interest rates yeah. will go up and will bounce back yeah. quite severely right. beca because of all this cash that's in the system that perhaps wasn't there before to that's that right. magnitude, right? Yeah, that's right. There's a wrinkle around that, though, which is there's no such thing as the interest rate mm. in any system. You know, I don't get to borrow at negative ever. I don't mm. get to borrow at zero ever, right? So the policy rates that people fixate on, I think, stay very low for a very long time, mm -hmm. probably less than what they think, because of what I said before. Central banks are telling um, elected officials to spend money, and they're telling market participants, yeah, we actually want inflation in the system. Mm. But off the back of that, market rates will change. Yeah. Um, so, so really, it's, it's an environment where, hey, it's OK to be, well, they're basically inflating inflating some of the problem away or that's the strategy here isn't it and totally totally i mean the this um you know symmetric symmetrical it's a wrong term but I can't that. It's symmetrical inflation tar targeting which they're talking about in the states is effectively saying hey look we want the target to be two because we've been below two for a long time we're, ha we're happy to have it be above two for quite a while right okay to make up for lost time so it's very odd i, I think it's very the notion is that if if the if two is the cap and you bounce off that and come back down, people's expectation will be below two, and so therefore they'll be too close to deflation for comfort. Because if you have a lot of debt in the system, you don't want deflation. That's yeah. that's that's toxic. So that's the worst thing. Yeah, yeah. So um, there will be a tolerance for inflation, but that just reinforces the dynamic that mm -hmm. I'm talking about. It. Because you're mm. not going to get the choking off. The punch mm. bowl is going to be left out in the open as the party is going bunta. Nice. And that's very different. That's very different. Yeah. So, um, yeah. you know, pre-1929, uh, interbank rates were raised in August, um, you know, before the crash in October. Uh, the Fed had started raising in 99 and into 2000, you know, in advance uh, of that event. That's not happening now. Uh, and it looked like economies were slowing down a bit. I don't know in 29, to be honest. Um, um, they did look like they were slowing down in 2000. I mean, you did have this sort of, you know, waning in activity. That is not apparent, hmm. certainly not yet, and, and probably not until the end of this year or, or something hmm. like that. But that said, markets pre-price stuff. So, you know, there, hmm. there's, there's elements of pre-pricing there. Hmm. And maybe it feels like it's all happened. Um, because if I'm saying it, everybody knows it. You know, I'm no brighter, or you know, I don't have a you know a better telescope than anybody else. So we must look for evidence that maybe this isn't fully done. And one just has to look at the global banking, sec you know, sector as, a, as, a, as an investment um, mm. tool, yeah. wearable, and and global energy, awful, awful. Yeah. I mean, look at these global energy majors. They're about where they were in like the late nineties. In terms of, I mean, nominal share price. I don't mean valuation. I mean, nominal share price. The share price, if you'd bought in like 97 and held till now, you made zero nominal dollars. You know, some of that's environmental um, considerations and, and, and appropriately so. But that just speaks to this point that the world is not at all terribly, not at all excited about growth prospects or reflation or worried about inflation. We can see that in tips and growth hearings. They're, they're not worried about inflation. People yeah. aren't worried about inflation. So that feels maybe like, hey, this guy's saying there's no, there's going to be inflation, and bond markets are saying there's not. Markets are never wrong; they just change, 
and they change quite quickly. You know, the yeah. the onset of inflation can come really very quickly. And yeah, I just worry as well, like just on that, because if if that punch bowl is left out and if everybody in the party was was getting slightly inebriated and then someone shows up with a bunch of crack cocaine, it's going to the next level, right? Oh, so, hell yeah. I think it's a really strong possibility. I mean, so, so all we have are these sort of mental models and mathematical models of, of past events. And they're always wrong. You know, they never they never capture anything. And, and, in, and in, in this instance, things are really quite extreme and you could get to really quite extreme outcomes. But that goes back to general cautionary principle. People must understand this is a really unusual time and it's absolutely not the ideal time to be throwing a whole lot of money into markets as a buy and hold strategy. Hmm. Now, why can I say that? Because the big, big years of gains are always after the market has collapsed. Hmm. And I know, and I actually really have a strong sense that people feel like it did that in in February and March of 2020 uh, with COVID. It, it didn't. It didn't do that at all. It, it, it did something like the reverse. Hmm. So bank lending accelerated in that event. Corporate bond issuance accelerated in that event. Not, not in the first few weeks of it, to be fair, in, in that um, February 23 to March 19, I think it was. You did get a bit of a cessation there, but immediately you hit that hit that low in in late March. Everything just reopened, and as the recession actually started in the economy, lending growth increased into the economy, mm. and money supply exploded in the economy. And that's just never happened, never mm. happened in a recession. So it's a very unusual event. Now translate that over into equity markets. You didn't get a change of leadership. You didn't get the leaders going into the bubble period underperforming on the way down. You didn't get that at all. They actually performed about the same as the market and then bounced much more rapidly than the market. So you've got a reinforcement of the prior leadership. That's that's not what an end of a cycle looks like. So just to make it really clear, what would an end of cycle scenario kind of look like if, if that was to be, quote unquote, a proper sort of correction, if you like? So um, corporate spreads um, blow out. So, so what does that mean? Uh, companies just can't borrow money mm. as easily. They, they can, but at a much higher rate. Lots and lots of bankruptcies, lots and lots of unemployment, but for much longer periods of time than what we've witnessed. Um, and capital, capital isn't injected into the economy. Capital's taken out of the economy. Mm. So, so as, as policy rates fall, in a recession, corporate rates are going up in a recession. Mm. Because I'm now a banking uh, a, a credit officer at a bank and you you own um, a, a tyre franchise or something. Mm. Yeah, and you, you come to me and say, hey, Julian, can I, can I have some money? And I'm like, uh, yeah, unemployment just went to 12%, so no. Mm. But, the, but the interest rate went down. Not yours, buddy. Mm. <laughs> yours went up. Risk premium, because yeah. you have bad credit now, hmm. right? So the spread goes out. That didn't happen. You know, I mean, there's great uncertainty. So if you go and look on the, you know, the sort of Federal Reserve, you know, the United States Central Bank's um, sort of data bit, the, the St. Louis Fed, you know, that, they have these shadings for when recessions happen and they've got a different colour on the, this one because it says, we, we don't know if it's over. We don't know what it is, <laughs> right? So it is a very, very unusual event with huge liquidity being forced into the system in mm. the presence of um, you know, very, very significant inequality of uh, income and wealth. And kids like me are sitting at, you know, sitting at home and they still got their job because it, you know I work from home now. I work forever, but I am working home right now. And so oh, I had a bit of a dabble. Um, and all my living expenses went away because I can't go outside. So mm. that's just a tiny part of it. But 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 it, it, it's a very, very unusual event mm. where in the presence of incredibly high asset prices, none of us can know how it all ends. For God's mm. sake, be careful. Let's talk about that liquidity event that you just referred to there, just to flesh out what you mean by that. You're talking specifically about quantitative easing or money printing from you know central banks around the world. 
that obviously filled in that gigantic pothole, which potentially made, you know, freed up the credit to flow shortly after that event last year. What happens when we do kind of come to the end of this tunnel, the, you know, the punch bowl is still out, strong indications that rates will stay low for longer. We, we, we're okay with inflation. You're gonna soak in it for longer. It's gonna be great for your skin, all the rest of it. But what happens when that catches up to us? Surely that's going to, surely it's gonna overshoot. I'm thinking it's not just gonna be above 2% by a little bit. There's no way that they can actually control things beyond that. Like, are we talking about potentially a situation where it could go, say, even to hyperinflation, where things kind of quickly lose control, do you think? Hyperinflation is a rare. Um, they, 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 don't, they don't ever happen in functional economies. I get annoyed when people talk about, you know, an Australian, New Zealand, American economy going into hyperinflation. Um, that they happen generally in the presence of e extreme economic damage. So think about the think about Weimar Germany, which is really kind of the reference point. That's the most impactful hyperinflation um, because it still today influences European Central Bank policy. I promise you. I promise you, the guys and girls, they're mostly German and they mostly have this hard money um, fixation and it's mostly because of this inherited memory of Weimar. Why did Weimar happen? France invaded the ruler. Like France took the industrial heartland of Germany, right, and then said, hey, guys, we want 6% of your GDP, having taken your industrial heartland, have a go at that. Mm. Impossible. It was impossible. Mm. It was not because a functioning government said, oh, you know what, I'm going to put a bit more money. That is not what happened. These things mm. don't happen. You know, Zimbabwe happened because they stuffed up their whole, like their whole export industry, which was the only way they got hard currency. You had that sort of land appropriation stuff and you devastated that industry. So you had no income at the same time as you're printing incredible amounts of money. So that is the model that will have to have in mind for hyperinflation. Very right. rare happens in the presence of immense economic damage. Um, accelerating inflation of the type we saw in the 70s requires a really different institutional context to what we've got in the economy. And I mean, Labor's got to be much more powerful. Not for a while. So you're talking about wages, wages push inflation, right? Yeah, wages. Yep. It's, it's absolutely wages, right? Mm -hmm. So, by the way, I think we do have very significant wage inflation but it's only in tiny elements of the economy. What I'm hearing from you is that, hey, we might be coming towards the light at the end of the tunnel here. Things, you know, it's a bit too soon to say, but if, if this model that you're building is correct, maybe there's some optimism sooner rather than later, and we should start to be looking up. It might feel like things are high right now, but things could even go to the next level. Is that is that correct? Not quite. I, I actually wouldn't mind you know, giving you a little bet that markets are at or very close to their high watermark for a very long time. Right. In the aggregate, driven by a pretty limited number of, of stocks. But that doesn't mean there's no money to be made, right? I mean, so equity markets went nowhere from about 65 to about 85. 1965, about 1985. Not quite. It was, it's, it's like more like 66 to 83. Peter Lynch when he was running the Magellan Fund for Fidelity, I mean, that guy compounded like nearly 20% a year. Hmm. Now, why? It's because he had a similar event in the early, um, in, the, in the late 60s, um, driven up, um, you know, by this immense, uh, it was a tech, there's a sort of mini tech bubble. IBM, right. EDS, Lockheed Martin, Textron, Westinghouse, blah, 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 Polaroid kind of. Right, so you had this nifty 50 type thing, and then it just left all the rest of the market behind. We did something a bit like that um, post 99 through to 84. We, we outperformed markets by about 180% over about four years. They're rough numbers. Please see our website for this glamour, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I'm not promising anything like that in the future. What I'm saying is that stuff can happen in markets that go nowhere. And I think it will happen at some point because the difference between good and bad, you know, expensive, cheap, has never been this great. Right. I hear what you're saying. In the yeah. history of markets that, that we have data on, it's never been like this. Yeah. Um, 
some of that's accurate and and some of that is you know technological change and, and all the rest of it but please do understand that we all live every minute of every day at the technological boundary of society right like technology was really exciting in the 20s you know uh, automation electrification radio automobile god damn that is incredible social change i mean i think that dwarfs what we're going through you know you went from walking or riding a horse <laughs> right to to a recognizable modern society mm. right with with radios and you know cars and all that right so enormous change and it was really exciting and it got people really excited and they lost a whole lot of money right now I am not predicting that about the future because remember, I don't know. I'm saying the probability is pretty high. Mm. But what gets left behind in these events, that's where, you know, that's where I think things are really exciting. Yeah. And that is stuff like, you know, energy, financials, um, I mean, basically all your, your emerging market type stuff. Um, uh, Japan in particular, Europe to a lesser degree, um, to, uh, and some you know there's new ones around europe but um so so there is stuff you can go and own because it's been left behind but if we're talking about aggregate market levels remember the start of the conversation i was saying we've never been this expensive mm. yeah in history and ever's a long time so um that does speak to a general cautionary principle about wanting to take all your capital and shove it in the markets mm. I, don't, I, I just don't think that's a great idea because I was going to, but no, I won't now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Done. <laughs> no, that's good. That's a good perspective. So, just tell me before we finish up, what is what are what, what's your perspective on you know gold, mining stocks, industrial stuff? What what do you think about that sector at the moment? Is it like I know with oil, right? Surely the demand will come on at some stage. I know nothing at all about that market at all, but I'm just keen to hear your perspective. Yep. Um, gold gold hates a reflation. So, you know, as, um, as inflation and growth accelerate, gold gets left behind. I will always own some gold to very varying degrees um, because the monetary denouement from here on out, I don't think there's any way out except to print. That's, that's the only answer. And I think the cessation of that process is so unrecognizable, I wouldn't want to guess at it. But I, look, I would draw some broad parameters around it. The dollar-based international exchange system is frankly stupid. Everybody knows it. Mm -hmm. And we all sort of skirt around it. And it's going to take a probably a crisis to break it. Mm -hmm. And so I need to have a little bit of that, that sort of barbarous relic to, yeah. to ensure against that outcome, um, but not to, you know, in, in varying degrees at different times. When you want to own gold is in a, um, you know, falling uh, growth and falling rate environment in particular. You know, so, yeah. so real rates are low, but the economy is not doing anything for these other, other you know, things that are, are, are exciting. Um, so, so point one. Um, the other point around broader commodities and, and energy, they have never been so cheap in the history of capitalism relative to equities. So would I own some? Yeah. Yeah, I would. And I, so and copper, oil, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff, is that kind of what yeah, you're talking Yeah, absolutely. I, look, I, I do, you know, so shudder to mention oil. Um, I, I, I absolutely know that the climate has changed at our hands and I absolutely know that we have to use less of it and I absolutely know we're addicted to the crap. So, mm -hmm. you know, someone's going to make money. So so energy is part of the mix. It just has to be. Um, from a, it, it, Well, it has to be part of the calculation. If you want to avoid it because of ethical concerns, feel free, but you must acknowledge its existence. It's one of the biggest industries in the world. Mm. Um, but it'll be a very different industry in 20 years, and and I'm really hopeful about that. I mean, we'll we'll be very very electrified in the in the transport sense in 10 years, which is great. Mm. But look, 
passenger transport is 25 percent of world demand but but energy is a huge industry that dwarfs all the metals um and 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 in a reflation environment it's part of the mix uh and then all your base metals uh I, look I, I i think the next 10 years is, is spectacular for stuff like copper uh less so zinc um silver copper nickel cobalt you know those battery metals uh really important um steel prices have gone through the roof already um you know, they're, they're sort of boring old pretty crappy things um but in a world that can grow a bit you don't you don't want to marry them but you do want to date them um nice. you know these are not compounders that you can just sit on forever i don't want to suggest that but but yeah. they're, they're they're of interest here um so before we finish up julian do you want to just um Tell me about you know a couple of other things that you're thinking about before we finish up for our audience. Sure, I, I think really in as a summary, I would say uh, we 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 all must be reminding ourselves to exercise a general cautionary principle, even as markets might push higher. Um, um, investors have crowded into a limited number of positions in in tech and related uh, exposures that are potentially very dangerous, but there's, you know, vast tracks of the rest of the world, you know, so so basically anything non-US dollar denominated that look very, very interesting and, and can make you money for the next 10 years, five or 10 years. Um, um, but it is a, a very, very ele elevated point in, in terms of the history of market um, um, pricing and valuation and, and people need to have some caution. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Julian. Now, if people want to find out a little bit more about what Platinum Asset Management is about, where's the best place that we can point them to? Uh, go to um, uh, www.platinum.com.au um, okay. and have a look at uh, our website and, and speak, to your, speak to a financial advisor. You know, if you if you take any area of your life seriously you get coaching so uh, yeah. i would i would do that yeah awesome appreciate that okay well thank you very much julian enjoy the rest of your evening over there absolutely i will thank you very much i really appreciate the chance to talk to you darcy i, I was i always enjoy talking to you good on you all right thanks very much <laughs>